Hi, Year 11. This is Miss Axman, and I'm just going to share with you a little bit about Macbeth today. So Macbeth is the eponymous character in the play, meaning the name of the text is also the title character, like Frankenstein or Jekyll and Hyde. So Macbeth is a really interesting character who transitions greatly from the start of the play to the end. At the start of Act 1, Shakespeare creates a really clear impression of Macbeth before the audience even meets him through the discussion of others who refer to him as brave and noble. Duncan even refers to him as a worthy gentleman, which is quite high praise as it's coming from the king himself. Macbeth fights to defend Duncan against a traitorous stain of Cawdor, a title which Macbeth later inherits himself. This may even foreshadow to the audience Macbeth will become a traitor just like the original Thane of Cawdor had been. On his way home from the war, Macbeth and his colleague Banquo meet three witches who make three prophecies to Macbeth, the most important one being Macbeth will become King of Scotland. Macbeth writes a letter to his wife, who immediately decides they should not wait for the crown to come to them naturally, but rather plans to commit regicide, which is the act of killing a king, to ensure the crown comes to them quickly. However, Macbeth wavers in his actions and seems to not want to, uh, to not want to kill Duncan, as he's been so kind to Macbeth. However, after relentless bullying from his wife, he decides to commit the murder. Immediately after killing Duncan, Macbeth regrets his actions and says no one is safe anymore, as Macbeth doth murder sleep. And really, killing a man unprotected in his sleep is also quite a step away from the brave warrior on the battlefield the audience was initially introduced to. As the play progresses, Macbeth finds his paranoia rising about being caught after committing the regicide, and this causes him to plan the murder of several other key characters in the play, um, including Duncan's guards, Banquo, Lady Macduff and her son, and the young Seward. By the middle of the play, um, Macbeth turns to the witches again for advice, and they provide him with three main apparitions that provide a false sense of security for Macbeth. One, they tell him he must be wearing Macduff, Two, no man born naturally of a woman will be able to harm him. And three, they tell Macbeth he's safe until Burnham Woods come to Dunsinane Hill. Macbeth believes these things really can't happen, and he, he really clings to them desperately to try and fill himself with false confidence. However, by the end of the play, Macbeth seems empty and has nothing to live for. When his wife commits suicide out of guilt, he seems to be emotionless and reveals no signs of grief over her death. When Macbeth faces Macduff in the final battle, Macbeth knows he's doomed, but chooses to fight to the death anyways, thus returning to that brave soldier we really saw him as at the start of the play. Now what's interesting about Macbeth is that Shakespeare presents him as what is called a tragic hero. This is a character in literature who starts off noble and virtuous, but through their own actions causes their own downfall and ends up in ruin. Macbeth is a character who does begin noble and virtuous. He's a soldier. He fights bravely for Duncan. And through his own tragic flaw, which is his unchecked ambition, his life spirals downward as he commits multiple acts of murder that eventually lead to his own death. So I just want to briefly share three significant quotes about Macbeth that I think are worth considering in detail. In Act 1, Macbeth exclaims, Stars, hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. So at this point, early in the play, Macbeth is considering committing regicide, and he seems really ashamed of his actions. One way to really consider this quote is to, is to believe that Macbeth is hoping for a dark night without any stars in the sky, so he'll be able to su successfully murder Duncan without being seen. A deeper layer you may want to consider is if he's addressing heaven when he speaks to the stars in the skies. As Jacobean society was very Christian and believed the king was chosen by God himself, Macbeth may be worried for the state of his soul if he defies the chain of being, and therefore he hopes no angels will be worried, or will, sorry, will be watching amongst the stars when he commits this wicked act. A second quote to consider from Act 3 um, is when Macbeth appears to begin regretting all of these murders he's caused. He says, I'm in blood steeped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as to go over. So this is really powerful imagery. I always picture Macbeth in a sea of blood upset with himself at this point. He explains he is steeped, so covered and so soaked in the blood of his victims that it wouldn't matter if he stopped now. He feels it would be just as hard to stop killing at this point as it would be to keep moving forward. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what he does next. Both stopping and continuing would be equally horrific. 
so he decides he may as well carry on with his violence. He feels guilt, but he's not going to be slowed down by his conscience at this point in the play. I think a final quote that shows the ruin of Macbeth's character is after he's told of the death of his wife, and he, he really shows no grief. He simply states, Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And I think the audience would be shocked by Macbeth's ideas here. He has everything he wanted, um, the crown, the power, almost all of his enemies out of his way, and yet he seems to not care. Ironically, really, he uses the metaphor of an actor to suggest life has no real meaning and we have no real lasting impact when we die. We're only here for a short time and to play a simple role, and, and we can be as loud as we want, but that's it. He seems to have lost all ambition here and has no interest in living anymore. Um, and it's really clear to see at this point that Macbeth has allowed his tragic flaw of ambition to lead to his own downfall. Uh, and on that cheerful note, that ends our very brief session on Macbeth. Thanks for listening, Year 11.